where you don't have a past, only a future. And I, I love that because we often get to a place in points in our lives where we are still being weighed down. Whether this is your first time coming to church and you have uh, given yourself courage to come here and you have strengthened yourself to be here. Or this may be your, your dozen time or your 20th time, your 100th time. You, you know, Perhaps maybe this is your 30th year of coming to church and, and every time we come to the house of God, we have to come to a place and say, I'm going to let go of some things that I can focus on you. And we still have things in our lives that still weigh us down. We still have things and problems and situations that still weigh us down. We often are often always still carrying things that we're dealing with uh, even uh, last week or last month or last year. You're, you're still paying for on a bill on something you bought four years ago. And you're still trying to get over that hump. You're still trying to get over that thing. And, and it seems to still weigh on you. Although you have sat through service after service. Or you perhaps have read book after book. And you have tried to make yourself believe that you have overcome. But only, only to find out that things creep up into your life. And they remind you. This world will remind you of what you used to be. And what you used to do. And what you used to say. And you are plagued by the thoughts. You're plagued by the things that still creep up on your past. And people still remember you as the one who used to do that. And they don't recognize the fact that you have been blood bought and you have been saved by the power of Jesus. And, and maybe you don't even know that you attend a church. And they don't know that you attend Bible study. They don't know that you are faithful to God with your time, your talent, and your treasure. And oftentimes it's those things that weigh us back. And we are trapped in our own mind. We're trapped in that place and we deal with emptiness and brokenness and we're often always having to repent. And that's why Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. There are some things that daily I have got to overcome. Now I know I've got a past. I know I've got some things I'm not proud of. I know your neighbor has some things they're not proud of. They're not proud of you. You have some things that you wish were not part of your life, but they happened. And it happened. But you now have, you have, you have gone to God. You have come boldly to His throne. You have gone boldly into His presence. You have been redeemed by the power of Jesus. And you have been set free, so to speak, as much as you want to believe it. You have been set free. But then you will go and leave and exit this wonderful building and you're back to square one. Where on Wednesday morning you're still dealing with the things that you were battling through and praying through that last Sunday. And you really haven't realized that deliverance has taken place and that God has really, really saved you. And that door of unbelief begins to be present in our lives. And the door of unbelief is one door that we seem to walk through daily because we are flesh and blood and mortal people. We want to see to believe. We want to see it first, taste it first, test drive it first before I make the purchase. But we know that the world ways and the kingdom ways are so much different. That the people of God don't live by sight here, but they live by faith.
for your availability to reach out and to use, but we must believe. Amen. We must believe. We must know that God is able to do it seemingly. Jesus was preaching. He says in the Gospel of Luke, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering the sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. There is no one exempt from that description. There is no one that says, I don't fit that description. Jesus. I beg to differ, we all fall short, and we all need the grace that only comes by Jesus. We're the ones that need to believe that God is evil. So Noah builds his ark. Noah builds the ark, and he builds the door according to what he thinks it should be built in. You know, we live in this life where we often feel that we aren't good enough. I don't deserve the grace and the mercy of God. I don't deserve because I've lived a life that is so bad. I'm ashamed to tell people who I was and what last name I belonged to and what I used to do. I'm ashamed of those things. And you live that life and you built a door. And it's the type of door that they built for little chihuahuas. <coughs> Imagine trying for you to fit through a door. That was built for a dog. Because you feel you don't deserve the mercy and the grace of God. The door of unbelief has made you believe that you're not good enough to enter into his presence. Although I don't know how I'm going to make it. And I don't know if I'm even good enough, God. Lord, I still want to get in your presence no matter what you right. see. People struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They struggle to squeeze through doors that were not created for them. They weren't created for them. They try to walk through someone else's door. They try to walk through a door and hope, hoping that the door will remain open and you can sneak right in. Have you ever sneak in this somewhere? I hope there's someone to come in or not. <laughs> and the door was left wide open. And, it stuck, right? <laughs> and we realize that we're not good enough, that we can't make it. And we see in Scripture there are people that are never and haven't been good enough. And we see that one who was as close to Jesus as you can find was not good enough. There's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He was a disciple. He was one who uh, followed after God. And of the 12 disciples, the Bible clearly says that three of them were given access to closer parts and things of God because they just seemed to be close to Jesus. They seemed to be close to Him. God manifested in the flesh. And, and, and it showed that Peter was one of those individuals, the one, the one who would end up cursing God, was still one of those Individuals. In fact, he, he received a revelation of who Jesus was. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, He asked, Who do you guys say that I am? Call me prophet, teacher, Mac Daddy, Big Daddy. <laughs> but what do you guys call me, right? And Peter rose up as crazy as he is. I think Peter was the evangelist because he said the first thing that was on his mind. He said, blessed, he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed art thou, Simon, or John, of the flesh and blood, and thou reveal it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I said unto thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. He's prophesied, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and it shall give unto thee, and I shall give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt find on earth, Shall be bound in heaven, what's over thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. You're getting the keys to the Lexus. You're getting the keys to the kingdom. And he did that. So you, you go over the Gospel of Luke, and I love the Bible because it paints so great of a picture. And, and it's, it, it 
keeps everything together and it confirms itself all over. In the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 22, verse 31, and this is where they're kind of sitting out. You ever have a friend tell you, I got your back? And they really don't. <laughs> I, got, I got your back. back <laughs> um, and uh, I'm busy right now. Can, can you pick me? I, oh, I don't have no gas. But I, I'll pay your gas. Oh, but uh, I don't have my car. <laughs> there are people like this. I got your back. And, and, or let's go out to eat. And you guys go out to eat. The bill comes. Like, oh, I gotta do this <laughs> <laughs> Right? You know someone, if you're sitting by them, don't say anything. You know, like, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I got like, you know, why? Why? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, we say things that really sometimes don't really mean. That. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> And the Lord talks to Peter and he says, And the Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, wait, I'm converted? I thought I was already converted. I thought I was already written in the Lamb's book of life. I thought I was already approved to sing on the platform and, and to do the deacon's duty because right. I've been converted. Come on. He wasn't converted apparently. <laughs> when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, was given a, a foreshadow. He was given a, a telling of what was going to happen. And he said unto the Lord, I'm ready to cope with thee, both into prison. And to death. And he said, this is Jesus telling them, saying, I tell thee, Peter, the crow shall not, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. You're going to deny me three times. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. And it happened. He denied him three times, and he had a few moments where they found him cursing. Now, don't be honest, but... Come on. Have you ever been so close to God where He's shown you things? He's revealed things only for you to go around and curse and deny. Peter, the greatest, or well, one of the greatest of the apostles. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. Now, I'm thankful to know that but it's even more gratifying for me to know that Jesus is looking down in my heart and he is praying for me that my faith will fail not so when everyone else has given up on you you can look unto Jesus who says you can and you shall recover you shall be delivered
denies the Lord. And the story is told that he comes back to a place where he is at a repentant state. And Jesus and had foretold something that I believe it. And as Jesus did what he was called to do, he came to do exactly what we talked about. To preach amen, and to set those that are captive free. And he did his ultimate mission. His ultimate mission was not just to heal bodies and to do miracles. Those are byproducts of salvation. So when you come to God for a need of healing, financial blessing, for whatever you need in your life, the greatest need that you should have is salvation. That's right. Oh, yeah. so, right. Because it may or may not come to pass. But the one thing that shall come to pass is that when I leave this earth and I enter into the next, I am going to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. That ought to be your greatest prayer request. Amen. So Peter does this thing, and we see that he is the preacher of the greatest conference ever to have been put on. And that was the Book of Acts conference. Come on. They all came together. Come on. And it was the one who denied the Lord. It was the one who, who cursed. It was the one who left That's his right. faith that Jesus had said, you're going to go through some stuff, but I have prayed for thee. You're going to go through some valleys, but I have prayed for thee. You're going to go through some setbacks, but I am going to set you up. But I have prayed for thee. Jesus is here to give us that thing, to 
not over. Right. Come on. It ain't over. Right. That's right. You go to another passage that has love. Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are walking. And they pass this gate called beautiful. If your wife is next to you, say you're beautiful. <laughs> I hear that. If your wife is here, say Beautiful. You see, this man was there, and he was begging. That was his job. He came daily, the Bible says. He was crippled from birth, and he came and he found his profession. So I'm crippled, God. So they saw what he knew. Well, okay. So they brought him there, and he was begging for money. He saw two Pentecostal people. I'm right now, right? Pentecostal <laughs> <laughs> You know, interestingly enough, I walked to a family Christian bookstore, and I failed the test. I'm sorry, I didn't. So he was there, hoping to catch the church people, saying they're going to give you something. He says, silver and gold, have I done it? Broke. Broke. But all the broke people say nothing. And it says in John, and in Acts chapter 3, verse 3, who see Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask alms. And I'm trying to wrap this up. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us, Peter's talking. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. But little did he know that he would become unemployed. That's good. I'm just saying, when you pray for a miracle, be ready for your life to be changed. Right you want a miracle, God, give me a miracle. But don't disrupt my life, no. The miracle is going to change your life. That was great. That was great. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I done. And this is what or words that he says, but such as I have, such as I do, right. such as I recover, such as I've been redeemed by, Amen. such as have I see God provide for me, such as God has been there for me, such as I have witnessed God be there for others. You've seen God do the miraculous. You've seen God do the great things. You've 